Hi everyone, Ted Wyman here with another edition of On the Rocks and guess who's back? Jill Officer, our good friend, six time Canadian women's curling champion. And she's back in the bubble in Calgary, ready to cover the World Curling Championship, the World Women's Curling Championship for World Curling TV. And uh, Jill, honestly, uh, what's this all been like? I think just a personal question for you, because you've now been in the bubble twice and all the testing and everything that you've had, that you've gone through to be able to do your job. What's it been like? Um, you know what? I, I it's It's been good. Um, you know, everybody's situation is different. And I just felt for me, it was, uh, there was an opportunity for a couple of reasons. I haven't worked in over a year. Uh, so it was an opportunity for me to uh, have a paid uh, gig a couple of times. Uh, it was an opportunity to be around curling, talk curling, sort of uh, put some of the what's going on in the world a little bit to the side, even though, you know, we're very uh, under very strict sort of uh, protocols, you know, we can be in our room or like in the hotel or we can be at the arena and um, we're tested every second day. So like that, that's, but it's just kind of become part of the routine. And I've just really enjoyed being here. I've enjoyed working with the group, with the people, just uh, being in the curling atmosphere. I love the game. And so it's been a really positive experience for me. Well, we all know that there have been a couple of positive COVID-19 cases uh, in the bubble or people entering the bubble uh, from Team Germany, certainly impacting their situation. Uh, they may have to play with three. Uh, this still hasn't been cleared whether they can do that at this point. But um, as a person who's in there and with the, the, the curlers that you do get a chance to talk to, um, how much concern is there over that in the general group and all the broadcasters as well? Uh, well, the thing that the thing about the way they have it set up here is that they have two different zones. So all the broadcaster, uh, all the the production crew is all in a different zone. We're in the blue zone, I think it's called. And then the athletes and coaches and all that sort of staff is in the green zone. So we literally are just waving to the players from up on the concourse. I, you know, I waved to to Anderson's team this morning, a couple of the other teams that I know, but we can't get down there really to, to talk with them. Um, and if we did, uh, we'd have to sort of make that arrangement to somewhat get close to have a conversation. So it's not like we can just uh, chit chat with them. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a little bit different from that standpoint, but I certainly don't feel any concern. Uh, and I don't think anybody else does either. I can't speak for the, the green zone or the player side of the bubble, but our side of the bubble, I think everybody feels really good. There's been no positive tests on, you know, um, on this side. And, and the only reason we saw the positive tests on the other side was, was from travel. Um, and so I think everybody here just feels, uh, feels good and feels safe. And I think the fact that we're being tested every second day makes a big difference with that. Yeah, no doubt. And um, so it's looking very good that the tournament's going to go forward. There was uh, practices on Thursday, which is great. Good opportunity for these curlers to get on the ice. But uh, what's the situation in your mind for uh, Carrie Anderson and her team right now as they are just a day away from their first experience in the World Championship? You've been there a few times. What kind of advice would you have for them? Yeah, you know what, I think, uh, you know, they've, they've already experienced the bubble. And so that that's a probably a bit of an advantage for them. They, they know what to expect in, in that, uh, in that way. Um, and with no fans here, I don't know, maybe it will feel a little bit different. But um, I, I, when you put that Canada jersey on, you have a target on your back. And I've always said that a lot of teams they get up to play Canada. It's like they they circle that on their schedule for the week. They you know um, they take pride actually. I think in in beating Canada and having that as a as a win uh, in their win column. So often you'll see the teams put their best game uh, of the week up against Canada. And I wouldn't uh, you know wouldn't surprise me to see that again. And so I think it's just something important to be aware of. But other than that, I think you just have to go out and play your game and have fun and enjoy it. And remember how good they've been playing. I mean, Carrie Anderson's been ridiculous in the bubble. Like it, this is the best I've ever seen her play for uh, such a long period of time. Not to say that she hasn't done it before, but she's been really good and the team's been really good. So I think if they just keep doing what they're doing, they'll be fine. Well, I was going to ask you as someone who's been a part of one of the best teams in the history of women's curling, 
how do you assess what Kerry Anderson's been able to do here? And we can start ticking it off with winning her second straight Scotty's Tournament of Hearts, then winning the uh, Canadian Mixed Doubles with Brad Gushu, and then semi-final at the Grand Slam Champions Cup, and then championship at the Players' Championship. I mean, really, that's a, a pretty incredible, what, couple of months. Yeah, it, it really is ridiculous. And I would love to sit down with Carrie and talk to her about the whole experience and like pick her brain about like, what worked for you? Like, you know, it was such a different situation for everybody in this in this bubble. And you came out and just embraced it and, and like played so well the whole time. Like from that mental standpoint, I would love to sit down with her and pick her brain about like why things went so well and what you know where the confidence is coming from in such a consistent manner so it, it's really uh yeah it's been really amazing to watch her and the team and i'm excited to continue to watch them although you know being with world curling te television you know we're covering all the games and there's lots of great teams here so she really does seem like more of a cool customer than she used to and i mean i'm not saying that she wasn't always that you know those nerves of steel coming out of the hack but i mean now it's like she's having fun with it too right like uh, there's a lot of uh, laughter and humor with that team i mean hey they know they're good but they're not gonna let the pressure get to them it seems yeah and you know i think that they've you know they, they had such a disappointment last year with um you know going to prince george ready to play in the worlds uh in home country and then to have that pulled away as all the teams did, I think that that was really, uh, really tough. And I think that they had to learn to just sort of adapt and, and embrace the whole situation that is in, is that the world is facing, right? I mean, we've all had to adapt here. So um, I think that they've just embraced it really, really well. And the fact that I think they're just happy to be together and happy to be curling. And I think that's showing a lot. It's funny, as a group, uh, you know, kind of cooped up in their hotel rooms, they made a pretty funny TikTok video, kind of uh, um, decrying the fact that everybody always asked them about being four skips, uh, which they're not anymore. They once were four skips, but now they're all playing their different positions. But do we make too big a deal out of that, Jill? Or Because in my mind, as a journalist, I don't see it as being making too big of a deal, because the truth is, they did something that was a little unconventional and it's been extremely successful. And I mean, it's important to point that out, but from your perspective, what do you say? Yeah, I think, I think it's old news now, truthfully. Um, I think they've proven, you know, they did last year, they've proven themselves. They've, they've now been proving themselves for a couple of seasons here. But I think it's uh, sort of beyond that. Right. Uh, at the beginning, I understand why that was the case. Um, and I, you know, right off the bat, I was like, well, if they know what their roles are, they might be okay. Um, you know, we'd had the opportunity to play with Shannon. We knew how good Shannon was. Uh, and then, I mean, Val and Carrie have been around and Brianne, you know, had maybe had a little bit, she'd been around a little bit, but, uh, you know, they've come together really well. And I think the biggest thing was that they knew their roles, uh, early on and they've embraced them and it's working really well for them. Yeah, I think Shannon's pretty good. Three Scotty's appearances, three championships. That's not bad. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, like, I mean, the one thing that I, I just can't help but think about when it comes to this, though, is whether you take out the equation of the four skips or not, they blew up their own teams, all of them did, to put this together, you know, for the Olympic cycle. And I think there's a story worth continuing to talk about in that alone, that it was as, success, as successful as it has been. I mean, you can't argue with the results, right? Yeah, and I guess, I guess you know, maybe it has been more successful than people thought, but when they blew up their own teams, it's not like they were the only ones that did that. You know, like at the end of every quadrennial, we see it in the men's, we see yeah. it in the women's, like, everybody's moving moving players around trying to figure out what the next best lineup is and so in from that standpoint like they were just doing what they thought was best and they obviously believed in it um but i i don't i think because they've repeatedly proven themselves now i don't know that it's as big of a uh, of a deal or an issue as uh as it once was how good is this women's field? I mean, uh, the talk about the men's field in particular was that it was one of the greatest world's fields we'd ever seen. 
Do you see that on this side as well? Uh, there's clearly some major players here, uh, starting with Anna Hasselborg from Sweden. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's a handful of teams that we see all the time in the Grand Slams, right? And that we saw in the last couple of weeks in the Grand Slams. But then there's these other teams like the the so-called Garlic Girls are back from Korea and silver medalists in 2018. And I mean, they were good. I don't know how good they're going to be here. I don't know how much they've been playing. I don't know much about but and then the the DuPont sisters from Denmark. I mean, they can always be incredible shot makers and so it's just uh, it's a little more um, it's a little more unpredictable I find in the women's and uh, I, I'm not sure that I could prior to the men's I feel like I could have named the six teams that were going to qualify their member association for the Olympics and I'm not quite sure I could do that as well with the women's. <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting point because there is some kind of wild cards in there that might come through and and surprise. There's no doubt um, as you mentioned the Garlic Girls. Well, they were a big surprise at uh, the Olympics in South Korea, but you know, then they sort of dropped off the map and here they are back. So it's a, you don't, just don't know what you're going to get. But the thing we do know with all of these teams is many of them were at that Olympics in uh, 2018 and Canada did not finish in the medals. And it didn't happen for the men either at that Olympics. And then Brendan Butcher didn't finish in the medals in these last worlds. It's not a given anymore for this country, is it? No, and, and you know what, I don't think it ever necessarily has been, at least even from my experience. I mean, as much as we won six Scotties, uh, we only won the Worlds twice. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we got a couple of other medals out of that, but we also finished fourth twice. Yeah. Um, so it's just like, it's just the way things are going now. Curling is growing and it's a good thing. It's a good thing we need curling to develop in other nations if we want to not only grow the game, but if we want it to remain a competitive, uh, like Olympic, official Olympic sport. So uh, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, so Canada helps the other athletes train by <laughs> having them into our country to, to train on the same tour. A lot of the coaches that work with these international teams are Canadians. And then they go out and beat us. I mean, it just doesn't seem right. But <laughs> truly, that is a, a pretty great thing about Canadian curling that that we do support the idea of growing curling, not just about winning. Yeah, and I think uh, you know we see a lot of coaches going over to other nations, and I think that is often an individual decision. I think some coaches want to be able to do that, and some maybe feel a little more loyalty to stay uh, closer to home. But in the big picture, I think that we're helping some of these nations. And I think it's a good thing because I always refer to like women's hockey, where it's the same two teams every time in the gold medal since women's hockey has been an official sport. I, that's not helping them. It's not helping them remain an official Olympic sport. And I know at one time there were some programs where they were using some of those American and Canadian players to help develop um, athletes over in Germany and things like that. Um, I don't know that I've seen the effects of that yet, but that's why when I look at curling, I think it's a good thing that we're seeing these nations like Korea, China, uh, Japan, and now uh, like Estonia is making yeah. their first appearance at the world championships, right? So I think that that's a good thing that we're seeing the development in those other nations. It's good for our sport. And that's a terrific comparison that you make because the truth is, Women's hockey has had a very hard time growing the game because, as you said, the top two teams are generally always the same. And I do think, and I was going to say this before you even brought it up, that curling has done a better job so far. It's kind of a model to look at for growing the game uh, to other parts of the world. And it's not just also rands that come from there. These are teams that can come and compete, as we saw at the men's, as we saw at the Olympics, and as we're going to see in these next uh, 10 days. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, there's there's even other teams out there, too, that we don't, you know, like a lot of people would probably be surprised to hear about some of the member associations that are part of the World Curling Federation and uh, whether or not they'll be able to develop to a point that they're able to, such as Estonia, develop to a point that they can qualify for a world championship, you know, will remain to be seen. But there's a lot of member associations uh, and a couple of nations from Africa, uh, India is a member association, Co uh, Kosovo is a member, like these are ones that you would never associate curling with, but there's people out there, often they're Canadian people who are living in these countries that are trying to bring curling to these countries. And I think it's great. 
Well, that's great stuff. As always, Jill, uh, I, I greatly appreciate you giving us your insight from inside the bubble. And uh, every time you come and join us here on On the Rocks, and hope we'll be able to do it again in the coming days as the Women's World Championship gets underway. Sounds good. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, Jill. For Jill Officer, I'm Ted Wyman, and you've been watching On the Rocks.